Thatcher Seltzer Rogers is a PhD candidate at the D Department of Anthropology at the University of New Mexico. He's the president of the Archaeological Society of New Mexico and a research associate with the Horonado Research Institute. He is also becoming the new director of archaeology business operations for the Office of Archaeological Studies at the University of New Mexico. Thatcher studies the archaeology of the Southern Southwest and Mexican Northwest region with an emphasis on the construction and transformation of indigenous borderlands. He has extensively published already on, on the region in American Antiquity, Kiva, the Journal of Anthropological Archaeology, the Journal of Arizona Archaeology, and Pottery Southwest, as well as contributing to a number of um, nearly 100 technical contributions and book chapters. We especially appreciate Thatcher spending, spending his evening with us this evening to share his research, as tomorrow he's defending his dissertation, and he'll be starting his new position next week. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Thatcher. Thank you, Fran, and thank you everyone else for being here. And um, I especially want to thank uh, two of my committee members, um, Paul uh, Minnis and Pat Gilman, who get to listen to basically the same talk two days in a row in a different format. And I really appreciate all they've done for me. I'm going to get started with my talk, um, which is entitled Between Casas Grandes and Salado, the Establishment of an Indigenous Borderland in the Pre-Hispanic American Southwest Mexican Northwest. Um, and I, I'm going to format it in uh, kind of the standard three-part act. Uh, the first is the general theory. What is the big anthropological research question I'm interested in, which is, what is a borderlands? And how do I define it for archaeological research? This is, and how does this make it intriguing and a useful framework for archaeologists in particular to pursue? Um, this is a really um, key time in borderlands research, not so much in anthropology, but in history, where there's numerous books coming out and theoretical paradigms that are being changed and large scale narratives, particularly for indigenous North America that are radically being redefined as um, uh, through a concept known as a borderlands. And it's not the borderlands maybe you've heard of before. I'll talk about that very briefly. The most of my talk though is gonna focus on the, the main point of my, my study, which is in what I call the international four corners area. And that's where the states of Arizona, New Mexico, Sonora and Chihuahua meet. Um, and what makes this a borderlands, not just today, but more importantly in the past? And when did this happen and some potential factors? This is um, perhaps the most important component for most of you who are listening. And I focused on differences between valleys and differences within valleys in my dissertation. And this talk will cover about 70% um, of my dissertation um, from, a, from a very summarized perspective. Um, I'm more than happy to address specifics later on, but I'm going to really bring it into the larger narrative and implications because this is really what it's all about. Um, how does my investigation and my reframing really improve our understanding of this area of the Southwest Northwest and more importantly, the broader Southwest Northwest um, as a whole? And so here's a little bit of theory. Um, we often use terms like cores, peripheries, frontiers, hinterlands, boundaries, borders, uh, more recently edge regions and borderlands to describe the relationships between different cultural entities and the nexuses that they form and the interactions that engage with. Most of these, however, occur, especially cores, peripheries, frontiers and hinterlands are between um, nation state societies and specifically sta nation state societies that emerged in the 18th through present um, uh, century, in a sense, um, and particularly through colonialism and then modern globalization with cores and peripheries and um, Wallacestanian um, core. Uh, world systems models. Uh, more recently, though, there have been those who have tried to look at what happens in between a non-state and a state society. And you see this um, globally throughout, particularly in South America and in Mesoamerica in some cases, with the Mesoamericanization of West Mexico in the 10th through 12th century. Um, you often see um, the similar types of concepts. But I was much more interested in, well, how does this operate in non-state societies, where you have two um, radically different, potentially sociopolitically complex societies, but um, they're non-state. They're not necessarily formally expansionist. They're not necessarily with rigidly defined political and military boundaries. Um, and this is something that's very um, apropos for indigenous North America in a sense. Of course, um, those of you who live in Tucson or nearby are readily familiar with the concept of a borderland, given you all live within one, according to the U.S. Customs. Um, myself, I'm in Albuquerque currently, and we 
very much also experience that sort of culture. And a borderland is typically defined by the presence of a very physical geopolitical border, as you can see here. Um, and that would mean that from an archaeological perspective, we really don't have borderlands, um, if you take that framework. That's a really old school model. Uh, more recently, anthropologists and historians have more or less stripped away the idea that we need a rigid, hard border. And even then, we see borders even today as being porous um, for many different reasons, cultural, population-wise, um, biodiversity in many senses, linguistically. Um, but borderlands themselves have uh, their origin um, back in the, the early 20th century, you could argue um, 1894, but really 1920 with Herbert Bolton's um, pioneer of, of Southwest borderland studies, this model of looking at really Spanish engagement in the Southwest, um, and really focusing on that rather than the earlier frontier models focusing on um, other parts of Europe. It, this was focusing on areas between two different um, colonial entities and the engagement with local indigenous societies, but it was still focused heavily. More recent historians, particularly um, Pekka Hemelainen and uh, Samuel Truitt, who is also on my committee, have really tried to reframe borderland studies to focus on, um, to remove the border themselves and to focus on this multi-directional engagement. And this is something that's also occurred in other in anthropological kind of literature. You see it in edge regions, this very, um, recent book by, by Karen Harry and Sarah Herr. And these focus on edge regions and they're trying to explore areas adjacent to these big complex cultural cores, the Phoenix Basin, Chaco Canyon, um, Members Valley in a sense, looking adjacent spaces. And what they focus on is how do adjacent populations engage with those larger, um, you could call them more complex, but that's not how they refer to them as a more complete cultural suite of attributes that we oftentimes attribute as, as Hokam or ancestral autumn, as we now call them more frequently. Um, and they focus on existing populations, migrants, resource availability, past histories and narratives. And this is a wonderful model to explore um, the exchange of ideas and culture over, over distance between different groups of people. However, it, it does have a small gap. And that's where I think the borderlands does help um, offer an insight because fundamental to, the, to a historian borderlands approach is time, deep time. It's one, it's one of the things we work wonderfully so in, in archeology. span It's situating a certain time and series of events within a broader narrative an understanding of multi-directionality and fluidity that can occur. So instead of looking at a core and a, and a edge region, you look instead at multiple cores simultaneously in a single space and looking at the differences within that. And that's something that I did. Additionally, we, we've also moved to considering um, indigenous borderlands. This is a very famous map. Um, it's actually an indigenously drawn map of, of here's Charleston, here's the colony of Virginia. It's actually drawn incorrectly. Um, if we look at it through a Western topographical geographical perspective, however, it's drawn by the Nassau right here, the Catuaba. And this dates to roughly 1721. It's actually a, re, um, a replicate, replica of it. It was uh, destroyed and made again two years later. And what I want you to focus on is the fact that the indigenous societies here that drew this map did not necessarily orient it correctly, but emphasized their place as space and relational to each other. So they're already focusing not necessarily on formally demarcated boundaries or spaces or power, but more so space and interconnectivity is, is drawing those relationships as being crucial to their own um, perspective rather than just a standard map making, map making as we would often think of it. And it's not just those societies in the Southeast that we find it in. We also find it here in the Southwest. Oftentimes when you hear the history of, of um, Spanish um, or the Spanish Entradas and then the um, corn, um, from Coronado uh, onwards to Onate and the colonization of, of the Rio Grande Valley, you often hear of it as being this um, pretty much a, an event that just happens and occurs and moves on. But really one of the most important changes that's happened is historians have started to discuss um, the concept of indigenous borderlands as indigenous controlled spaces, territoriality in a sense, within which there existed an island of Spanish occupied space, but from which they were surrounded on all sides, especially on the, the, the Eastern side where the Comanches were, um, by very highly territorial controlling and sovereign indigenous societies that controlled access. So it was really a matter of negotiation through multiple different ways. 
And that's a framework I kind of take, which is instead of viewing it as core centric, so there's a single core and that pretty much dominates everything, let's look at maybe more some of those more peripheral areas and try to understand what those tell us about the, the central dynamics going on. And here's a schematic. It's a wonderful heuristic by Archaeology Southwest of the main culture areas of the Southwest. Um, I would draw this over here and add the ornata a little more, but that's just me. Um, but our talk is going to focus on right in here, this area, this mismatch of Casas Grandes, Mogollon. Um, if you're talking to some ancestral autumn um, scholars, they would draw Hohokam all the way up to here. Um, I think it would be more around here, depending on what time period we're talking about, certainly the San Pedro is. And then this gap over here, the Rio Sonora and other cultures that are um, recently being extensively explored by uh, colleagues in Ina Sonora and Matt Pales and, and others. Um, but here's where we're going to talk, this area of overlap. It's called the International Four Corners. Here's a recent uh, map from publication um, from 2014. And as you can see, it kind of falls in between um, these different chapters that cover different culture. It's kind of this vacant quarter, if you would. Now, the defining trait of the International Four Corners today is the US-Mexico border, this dominating physical boundary. And in many cases, it is physical, the physical wall or, or um, some kind of other boundary, such as this uh, metal fencing that goes down there. Um, but that's not really what's the most important. It is important today, and it's important um, in how we talk about this region. But the main boundary in the past actually um, existed more on a north-south axis, not on an east-west axis. And that is what we call the Sky Island topography. Again, those of you who live in Tucson are readily familiar with this. It's a wonderful, um, very unique archipelago-like dynamic wherein you have these north-south running mountain chains, predominantly north-south running mountain chains that offer um, a variety of ecotones and resources available on an environmental, on a environment, um, elevational gradient in between are interspersed large valleys that occasionally have these um, seasonally infilled playas or, or lake beds. Um, it means that you have to pretty heavily traverse between these areas and find little passes such as here, um, Apache Pass, um, to transgress between one valley to another. And it has had major implications if you look previously at, at, culture, um, at cultural dynamics that occur within these areas. And I'll get to that if I have time right at the end of my talk. Um, this area, though, has had a really long history of, of archaeology, but it's been really focused. And first off, it started off with, uh, like many places, wide-scale survey in the 19, 1920s, really the 1930s, um, from two different institutions, the Peabody Museum with the Cosgroves, and then Gila um, Pueblo, more so in Arizona. And these established the areas being between Hocom or Ancestral Otham for the for Pila Pueblo and something going on with what was happening in northern Mexico, Casas Grandes for those out of the Peabody. Um, but since then, there hasn't been really that substantial work. And I'm going to talk about a few of the projects um, in my reanalysis of the materials. But the real emphasis in this area has been very recently. This has been 21st century research, um, predominantly using existing collections, something that I did. I did not do field work for mine. I did um, research using existing collections. But a lot of these also emphasize external focus models. These focus on um, enclaves, immigrants, uh, migration. Um, as you can see between these three, um, in the late pre-Hispanic period, particularly the 14th century, and major developments in these, particularly the relationship to Salado. This has been the defining hallmark of research in specifically southeastern Arizona for the past um, 30 odd years. Um, in southwestern New Mexico, uh, it's mostly been focused on a little earlier time period, the Membres, um, with a few iterant excavations. And these publications are, are absolutely wonderful. They've produced um, phenomenal um, major interpretations that have changed the way we view these. Um, however, I, I would argue just one kind of unintentional complication that's occurred from them is that we oftentimes um, just view the entire area of southeastern Arizona as Salado. And that's not entirely accurate, where we focus entirely on migration as the main process through which um, these, these larger communities establish themselves. And simultaneously, you have a different, very different interpretation. And this emerges out of Casas Grandes, um, this massive site um, located in northwestern Chihuahua, roughly there along the Rio Casas Grandes. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. I highly recommend if you have the opportunity, please go visit. It has a wonderful museum. Um, 
And this site is, I think most archaeologists would concur, it's fairly unique in the history of the Southwest, Northwest, and Mesoamerica. Um, not unique in terms of every attribute of it, but in terms of what it combines. It combines a very Puebloan architectural style um, here to the, e um, to the east with a fairly, you could call it Mesoamerican inspired, but it's not Mesoamerican at all, or even looks Mesoamerican. It just has inspiration such as a ball court, and but the platform rounds are very distinctive and different. Um, Western civic ceremonial precinct is how I would characterize, but others differ. Um, numerous McCall remains was a breeding center, um, has uh, elaborate water-based ritual um, within the walk and well and within the reservoir and other attributes that occur through here has canal systems. Um, had a population that numbered in the thousands, the specifics of which debate, and probably it certainly had its origins um, prior to the 12th century, but really kicked off in the late um, in the late 11 and late 1200s, and really um, post 1300s, and terminated probably around 1440 or so. Here's what it looks like a photo, of course, with this massive, and you can also see it behind me, um, with a, this is, of course, after the preservation and restoration of the site with adobe um, capped um, structures. The, the ceremonial structures themselves are mostly comprised of masonry, so it's a very distinctive um, structure method, and here's one of the um, uh, sewer canal systems that underlies most of the actual structure itself. Now, one of the key components of Casas Grandes is that it seems to relate to a regional system. That is, it's highly connected to sites directly adjacent to it within a 30 kilometer or 50 kilometer radius, depending on who you ask. And it's, it's certainly the largest site by far. Um, and we debate necessarily what this means. There certainly was social inequality there. Um, we have strong evidence that there were um, potentially elite priestly individuals. That's we're going to not get into the specifics of that, but we'll leave it at that. Re religious individuals who had um, authority in some way, um, whether this is through agriculture or through um, ritual, through spiritualism, is, is a very, um, it's not the point in this. What is the point is, though, a lot of archaeologists center Pakime within a broader Casas Grandes um, world, as you would. We would call it the Chaco world if we were in um, New Mexico, um, if it's a similar phenomena, but we can call it the Casas Grandes world if we want to. And of these, we have a very unique relationship to the north, this area of the International Four Corners, particularly that of New Mexico, based on really excavations at a single site, the Joyce Well site, which is one of those I reanalyzed. Um, but archaeologists, just like pretty much everywhere else, um, Chaco and others have very different ideas on how to explain the relationship between sites in this northern periphery, northern zone, hinterland, and Pakime itself. And there's two broad characterizations of them. Um, this is a bit of a straw man, but they're broad. Um, one is nebulous, disconnected, and variable. And this is mostly done by work actually in southeastern Arizona by John Douglas at the Boss Ranch and other sites. Um, and then also Kidder kind of describes this at Pendleton Ruin, which is right here, or integrated, organized, and part of a really larger hierarchical regional system. And this is, again, based primarily at Joyce Well, and then a little bit at 76 Straw, um, work by the Van Pools, and I'm not going to touch on that work. But what really makes this this um, that's a little bit what really makes this interesting is it also overlies the area of maximum overlap between Salado Polychrome and Ramos Polychrome right here, the two ceramic icons of these two very different cultural traits. Um, so Ramos Polychrome, of course, is the icon of Casas Grandes. It is um, ubiquitous on Casas Grandes sites, except for to the south. Um, it's iconographically charged, it's enriched, it predominantly post dates 1275, probably even 1280, um, contemporary with Salado Polychrome, which predominantly post dates 1300, with potentially 1295 or so, um, de depending on which treeing dates you want to use. Um, but they have very different histories. Whereas Casas Grandes polychrome, um, we strongly would argue, especially those of us who work in, in Chihuahua, would argue has very um, local origins. Maybe the icons are not entirely or local, but the design style, the techniques, the production, everything else is local about it. The vessel forms, this is not the case for Salado. Salado has its origins in um, the arrival of northeastern and Central Pueblo migrants into East Central and Southeastern Arizona, where they form enclave communities, um, particularly in one area, the Safford Valley. This is something I've written about and others have written about Anna Nutzel, um, Jeff Clark, Pat Lyons have all 
written about this. Um, and they have a very different history. They form into um, some integrate into communities and some actually establish new communities, potentially resulting in conflict. They bring in new ceramic designs and technologies, new ways of firing vessels, new ways of painting vessels, new ways of making vessel forms. And we think out of these emerged the lotto um, or called White Mountain Redware if you're in Arizona. Um, we in New Mexico still predominantly use the older term salado, but that's not always the case. Um, it's a variety of shared, um, predominantly locally produced um, polychromatic um, ceramics. And we know that they're predominantly locally produced based on the work of uh, Dr. Patricia Crown and a few others. Um, they're not always locally produced, but they're predominantly, they're not exchanged over a wide distance as was previously thought. And these are also iconographically charged, but with very different motifs than, um, than Casas Grandes, or at least different predominant motifs than Casas Grandes, this has been argued. Um, and so I kind of take the case that these are two different they're viewed as two different religions or identities. So what about the people who live directly at the intersection between these two people, where the maximum extent is um, between a Salado core that emerges in the Safford Basin um, and, the lower San, and the Lower San Pedro, and the Casas Grandes, um, Northern hinterland, if you would. And this is a really interesting time period because Oftentimes, when we look at the 1200s, we focus on expansion and introduction as causes for innovation. We get kivas in the Safford area and others, um, and we immediately, and this is probably correct, look at um, uh, look at migrants as the cause for these, particularly at the Goat Hill site, excavated um, by Kyle Woodson and colleagues. Uh, we also see these Casas Grandes ball courts. Uh, these are not the ball courts that you would find uh, necessarily if you were in the Casas Grandes Valley proper, but they're they're still you know, emblematic. They have a line of rocks and they're fairly straight and they're cleared in between. They're not Hohokam ball courts. They're Mesoamerican style-ish I-shaped ball courts, but they lack not always the, the clearing on both ends. Um, and they often use these to refer to that these sites clearly relate to the arrival of, of, of Casas Grandes migrants into these areas and these sites as the arrival of these traits. And yet what we don't know is the history of these sites individually. Here's excavations at Pendleton Ruin, um, where the, the Costco was excavated in, in October and early November 1933. Uh, Kidder oversaw the excavation, so it was sick. He helped write them up post-war um, when he got reinterested in the Southwest after a trip to um, Awatovi and a few other sites in that area. But what they found was repeated evidence of rebuilding and reconstruction, um, something that really archaeologists haven't pursued at other sites. Um, other animus phase villages to understand, do these have really long histories of duration? When did they start being occupied? Um, these are foundational to understanding, are they more closely related to Casas Grandes, Salado? Did they change over time? Um, how did the expansion of one or the other impact the local populations? Um, and we also get other traits such as uh, T-doors, um, very iconographic of, of Casas Grandes, at least in this form. You get these scallop platform horse, at least that um, Joyce Well and Culberson, and, and there's one at Timberlake, but I'm not gonna necessarily talk about Timberlake if you'd like to, I can in the question and answer. And then colored um, post holes, which are actually ubiquitous. We, we really shouldn't be using them as a defining characteristic of the animus phase. Um, you find them sometimes in alignments such as this at Joyce Well, indicating that, that some of these populations have stronger relationships to the South. So again, these are these are these ball courts. There's potentially one at the cowboy site. Um, this is a photo. It's labeled as being at the cowboy site, but many others have walked over it and not found it. Um, it might be mislabeled. Um, that would be my guess that this is actually Culberson, but in, I'm not entirely sure. But this is what Casas Grandes ball courts usually look like compared to these. They're very different. Um, some people call these the bush leagues, if you would. I, I wouldn't go too far as that. Um, but here's what I looked at. I looked at, um, oh, well, I analyzed ceramics from 11 previously excavated, well, 10 previously excavated sites and one surveyed site, um, did an architectural analysis of over 20 sites and have, um, I don't yet have these data, but I have uh, incoming neutron activation data from 450 ceramic shirts from most of these sites and a few more down here um, that will be forthcoming in the next uh, few months that will really help redefine how we think of exchange and local production across this region, particularly with respect to Casas and Salado. So these areas I'm working with and there's little clusters of sites. This is the, the main cluster maybe some of you are familiar with, Joyce Well, uh, Timberlake and Culberson. Um, this is the next one most of you may be familiar with, Pendleton Ruin. 
um, Clanton Draw and Box Canyon, and then a series of sites in far southeastern Arizona, um, including Boss Ranch and some of those that, are, that was previously excavated and then ones that I'm gonna talk about individually. So I'm gonna show you something. I, I actually haven't presented these before. Um, these are all the previous radiocarbon dating minus the rising site um, for this area of the Southwest Northwest that have been previously published. Uh, most of these are Ojo de Agua right here, all those Sonoran are Ojo de Agua. These are Joyce Well, the ones with really wide distributions and problematic. These are Joyce Well. I was able to reconstruct where they actually originated. That wasn't in the republication. This is, you have to go back to the DePeso volume and link them with the FS log. And then there's a few others that were published and then two from Boss Ranch, one from Mesquipe and others. And these just pretty much just showcase occupation sometime at most of these sites between 12, 20-ish and 1400 something and then something really wide and fairly useless here for um, Ojo de Agua. Here are all the new radiocarbon dates I procured as part of my dissertation research. Um, I some of these are combined. I, I had multiple specimens dated from singular contexts at, at uh, Joyce Well. Um, these three are all different contexts. Um, at, I had two at Clanton Draw, several at Box Canyon from different contexts, and they provide really um, excellent divergences in dates. Here's a broader understanding of these. Some of these are Arizona, as you can see, and some of them are New Mexico. Um, these will be published uh, fairly shortly. Um, these are the first new dates, really, and, and they, they show some interesting patterns. One, there's really not much that post dates 1200 at any of these sites, or at least that you can say. I mean, I can trim all these off by ceramics, and most of these based just on other data, um, architectural, actually. Um, there's some that clearly date to the 1200s, particularly these in Arizona. These these are actually very interesting sites, um, especially uh, the, this one right here. This is um, the Reagan site. And then some that date to the terminal uh, 12, uh, 1200s in New Mexico, Clinton Draw and Box Canyon do. They have their terminations um, probably roughly the same time in the late 1270s, early 1280s. There's our contemporary histories of reoccupation and closure, both at Jay Cowan, Joyce Well, and San Bernardino, where I have dates that span multiple time periods. Um, these dates are a little more problematic because they're based on wood. That's all that was collected from these sites versus those from New Mexico are based on um, all on maize. Um, and, but the animus phase, as we had often think about it, almost entirely postdates 1300. This, this heavy emphasis on Casas Grandes and Salado, which we could have already guessed, but there does seem to be a very clear break between sites that have, um, outside of a few, that have early, um, will have 1200s occupation and those that have true animus phase occupations. And these are the two sites in New Mexico that clearly probably terminated 1270, 1280. They had burning of the Pueblo. Um, I have dates from both mounds at Clanton Draw that were excavated. These were small mounds that were inhabited simultaneously um, based on the pottery. And then here is Box Canyon, um, probably the largest site in the International Four Corners at this time. This is one um, projection of the map. This is executed by McClooney and mapped out um, in 1962. Two, however, it might be twice as big or even three times as big. I, I don't necessarily believe those numbers based on a larger map that's been made. Nevertheless, um, also simultaneously burned at roughly 1280. Um, at the same time in Southeast Arizona, we have a very similar kind of pattern of these, of these small um, room block compounds in a sense, um, except for these tend to occur. This is the Boss Ranch excavated by, by John Douglas, very expertly provided some of the best data for this area up, and, up until I, I, I would say probably now, um, provides a good comparison. And they show a nice transition from um, 1100s to early 1200s to late 1200s, this occupation with a, um, within a, um, a wall that encloses a plaza space. It's been fairly disturbed. This is what Price Canyon looks like. This is one of four of these that exist at Price Canyon. These were all excavated by Cochise College. There was never a formal report. There was a summary report written, but never a formal report. And the pottery were never fully analyzed. Um, I analyzed about, mm, I'd say basically 100% all the pottery of them, um, which came out to be about 63,000 sherds from six sites. Um, but this is what they look like. And here's one of the more interesting sites, Reagan. Um, these are the maps we have to work with. Unfortunately, they're not always as nice as that for Price Canyon. In fact, we lack maps for two of the uh, three of the sites that were excavated. Um, Jay Cowan, um, Watson Windmill, and San Bernardino does not have a formal map. Um, but these share very similar kind of layouts. This is probably more in a, web, uh, more in a 
um, Pueblo kind of style with the compound wall that existed around it necessarily with a partially enclosed plaza. Um, but it dates earlier, it dates to the early to mid 1200s. And it really is interesting because it has a higher proportion of Southeast Arizona types, despite being contemporary to those in New Mexico. And by high proportion, I mean approximately a third to half of the assemblage is um, associated with San Pedro and a little further west, um, um, Santa Cruz polychrome ceramics. It's not really that much local. Um, this has been suggested to possibly be migration by uh, colleagues at Archaeology Southwest on a very smaller sample that they did. And I, I think they've got pretty good evidence of this. This is what these sites in southeastern Arizona look like. They're very shallow excavated adobe structures with sometimes with cimiento footer stones, sometimes not. Um, they've been heavily deflated by cattle and trampling and other activities, yet um, they contained a surprising amount of, of uh, material culture and a lot of actual um, tree beams uh, that are uh, could be potentially dated. Um, they've not been evaluated for that or submitted, but that's certainly possible. They have uh, boxes full, um, so if the True Ring Lab ever wants them, they're available there, Cochise. Um, here's what Darnell looks like. This is a 1300 site, much larger, um, probably on the order of 50 to 100 rooms or so. And it's more of your standard um, aggreg aggregated Pueblo with large, um, um, large wing walls and other contemporary room blocks connected surrounding enclosed plaza spaces. Um, this is on the eastern side of the Chiricahuas, um, and this is probably also the same for J. Cowan, which is on the western side. We just lack a map for it. Now, how about those in New Mexico? Those are all the sites in, in Arizona that are really focused on for the most part. Um, Pendleton has, this is what it looks like, at least one. There's a second mound that was excavated. It looks identical to this, basically. It's just across the plaza over here, um, and Kidder excavated both only reported the results of excavation from one of them, left the other in the notes, um, and didn't analyze all the pottery. Um, well, the, the cost groups didn't. There were numerous circumstances that led to it. But it's this enclosed plaza, uh, potentially with a platform on. This is something argued by John Douglas in an article, um, with a bunch of different rooms in here. Um, they have tea doors and a few other things there. Um, but he didn't really see it as Casas Ground is connected. Now, the main site people talk about is Joyce Well. Here's Joyce Well. It was, it was surveyed in 1962, excavated in 63, and then more recently by New Mexico State University as part of several field schools um, where they excavated here off the map, reopened room 18, excavated the ball court, and threw some test units across the, uh, across the plaza. Um, none of that material has been analyzed. Um, that's something I might do in the future. Um, they procured some archaeomagnetic dates, and that's about it. Um, but this is how the site looks, at least in most publications. What it really is, is this is about one third the site. It is a series of U-shaped open-ended pueblos that just continue on up to about probably um, maybe 300 plus rooms. And I radiocarbon specimens from uh, here, here, and um, up here. And there, well, here, here, and here in this room dates the earliest. There's also been earlier dates by De Peso from room nine. Um, well, there's by McClooney, but De Peso published them. Um, and what it showcases is that it's the radiocarbon dates and some of the pottery that this Pueblo grew much like um, a lot of other Pueblos, particularly here in the Rio Grande through accretion, whereby a portion is built and then it is basically terminated, no longer occupied, and then they construct more and inhabit that and construct more. It is possible all that was inhabited at once and they just terminated this earliest, but I think the most parsimonious is this dates to the, um, uh, to the early to mid um, 1300s and then the, most of the rest of the Pueblo um, terminated something, something around uh, 1360 or so. And then this is room 18, which is part of a series of rooms that all kind of look like this. They all have um, raised platform hearths, tea doors, and uh, 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 plastered um, uh, post holes, um, somewhat in alignment, not quite the same as room 18, which was probably um, based on also the artifacts within it, acted as somewhat of a, um, you could call it a ceremonial structure or a communal structure in that sense, but probably anchored the community within it, much the same way as uh, certain structures within Pakima anchored that community. I did a bit of an architectural analysis using um, Jeff Clark's RCI or Room Contiguity Index to look at. Um, are, are these sites from valley to valley constructed and laid out the same? Um, 
And most of the time when he looked at Tolado stuff in the Tonto Basin, he found a lot of compounds. We don't have a lot of compounds. Um, we have mostly room blocks and those isolated linear arrangements such as um, the Price Canyon site you saw. Um, a lot of those, um, particularly in Sulphur Springs and San Bernardino is these over here. Um, Animus phase, these are by Valley are over here, they're very room blocky. They're very different necessarily. And that fits very well with how Casas Grande's architectural um, sites are laid out, medio period sites, the post uh, 1200 sites. Um, so this kind of supports that maybe there's a little bit of distinction, but it's not as clear cut. Um, I mean, we've got sites over here that certainly fit within that and a uh, little bit of merging across. Now pottery, um, this was the main component of my dissertation um, and we have, all variety of types. We have Tucson polychrome, we have Slotto, Cloverdale corrugated, which is the main namesake of the ceramic type. We have Caretas polychrome, but we have lesser uh, mentioned types. We have El Paso polychrome, Baba Kumari Santa Cruz, some earlier red on brown types, especially um, Pendleton Ruin has clearly an underlying pit house component that was taken out by the Pueblo um, starting sometime in the 600s based on the pottery there. Um, there are some Northeastern Sonora types on occasion. They're actually very infrequent. Um, some Zuni and White Mountain Redware, and then some Rio Grande Glazeware, including at the Arizona sites, um, all, mostly all Glaze A, um, mostly San Clemente or um, Agua Fria, um, as I would type them. And we have the full suite of Casas types. It's not just that we have, this is from Darnell, and this is from Joyce Well. It's not that we have just um, Casas types without the icons. We have um, the same icons you would find in the Casas Grandes Valley, um, including figurative motifs and others, um, very elaborately decorated um, Ramos polychrome, which we will know shortly if they were, if any were produced locally with my sample size, should be able to tease that out. I suspect a small percentage were produced locally, um, more so in New Mexico than in Arizona, um, but that quite a bit's being exchanged um, northward, including from probably um, Sonora and the Bavespi area and others that we know also produce some. Um, we also get effigy vessels of Casas Grandes. There are effigy fragments at six of the different sites. Um, they're not all readily apparent what they are, but they include both zoomorphic and anthropomorphic, including fragments of shaman effigies um, for which we lack the remaining portions. We also have uh, all the pretty much the entire suite of Salado or Roosevelt Redware. Um, it's predominantly Gila polychrome with some with quite a bit of cliff, um, far lesser quantities of Tonto, but we also have all the late series as um, defined by, by Pat Lyons, Dinwiddie, Nine Mile, uh, Phoenix polychrome, no Los Muertos as far as I found, um, but those types that certainly date. Um, 1370, 1380, 1390 or so, which fits with the termination of the radiocarbon dates, I think. Um, nothing definitively post-1400. We have quite a few duck effigies, as we will call them, um, and especially fragments of them, the heads, um, particularly in southeastern Arizona sites, um, indicating stronger affinity there, which kind of fits with this east-west um, division, as you would think. Here's another one. And then, of course, all these variety of different ceramics, including those that are of a partial cliff polychrome bowl. Now, here's one of the more interesting types that I found, um, Cloverdale corrugated. It is described in the literature, um, I'm gonna say it first and then I'll give the caveat, um, as a red as a red slip gouged ware that's smudged. Um, John Douglas analyzed uh, Cloverdale corrugated at the Boss Ranch site and said that that's not the case if you read his dissertation. And he's absolutely correct. What it actually is, it's a highly um, obliterated, smeared and dented corrugated um, you can actually see the fingerprint indentations in it. It's not gouged. Um, sometimes it's really heavily obliterated, such as this and this, and sometimes you still actually get pretty much the full corrugation. And it comes in really much two varieties, plain and red slipped, um, which is very interesting. Cloverdale corrugated is the ceramic type used as the hallmark of the animus phase, this 1200 to 1450 time period. It's often been thought to relate to Playas red, Acasas Grande's red slip type. Um, I'm going to push back on that somewhat in a little bit. Um, and it's also thought to be oftentimes smudged. 
And that's somewhat true. It's oftentimes smudged. However, it's also, it's almost more commonly just polished or smoothed or even red slipped on the inside. Um, smudging is not ubiquitous on this, nor is the slip anywhere near ubiquitous. Um, formation techniques are very, um, in terms of finish um, and vessel form, the vessel forms are pretty standardized. You can see these globular jars and then bowls are very standardized um, in many ways in terms of what you get in the array of forms. Um, but the exact precise use of them varies. Sometimes you get smudged sitting on the bottom and sometimes you don't, sometimes you have smudging, sometimes you don't, sometimes you have pet erosion on the interior, potentially used for alcohol or some kind of acidic base, sometimes you don't. Um, something to look into in the future potentially with residue analysis. Um, but here's what it's usually thought to represent is this plyus red, um, this red slip finely polished, which it's not always fully red slip. Sometimes they, they leave a portion blank, um, but it comes in a variety of forms, including cord marked and sized, um, punched, corrugated, um, textured, a variety of different forms. Um, and it's usually polished and smudged on the interior of the bowl, although that's not always the case. Sometimes it's red slip as well. And then you again get these, these kind of more hideous, I would say, these, these really compared to these, which are very well polished and smoothed over. Um, these ones actually are kind of crackling and they're, they're breaking apart on the sides. Um, and that's not due to condition. I mean, this is, um, of course, restoration, but that's not due to restoration or the archeological material. They're actually um, potletting in some cases from the heat that they were subjected to, um, likely due to uh, the clay sources that are available and the tempers they used, um, which is usually uh, locally available sand with, with variable crushed rock. Um, but you also get El Paso polychrome. And these are um, something that was really interesting because um, I worked with some colleagues, um, Alex Corota and others, and we redefined a sequence of El Paso polychrome design styles um, based on whole vessels. And we have what we call style two, um, this dates to the 1200s, and style three, very definitively style 3A, um, which is a more um, stylized rendering with more curvilinear lines and potentially avian related motifs um, at numerous sites, especially Darnell um, has a, quite a bit of this. Here's what it looks like overall, uh, the ceramic analysis. Um, here are sites roughly arranged west to east. Um, the one I'm gonna throw out is Culberson, looks really different because this is a survey collection. Um, they didn't excavate the site. It has been subjected to excavation by landowner and looting, but uh, I didn't include the results of those because they're not really well known. This is a survey, but um, as you can see, the, the red slip is relatively equal to Joyce Well. The plane is just on, is just way underrepresented and painted as way overrepresented. You can see the impacts of earlier dating sites right here, and then Price Canyon, Watson Windmill also dates mostly earlier, but here are our late dating Salado sites, Darnell, Jay Cowan, Reagan dates a little earlier. San Bernardino dates late, but looks early, interestingly enough. So you can see some differences between the, the comparison proportions of painted plain and red slipped across this area. Where it gets really interesting though is when you break it down by wear category. Again, same arrangement, mostly west to east, southeastern Arizona, southwestern New Mexico, analysis of roughly 80,000 sherds, uh, full analysis for every site here. Culberson's just the survey, except for Joyce Well, where I um, only had time due to COVID to analyze 60%. Um, that site's been fully analyzed anyway, and my percentages pretty readily compare with those previously published, just with new types. Um, and what you see here is, again, Reagan. This is mostly Santa Cruz and Baba Kamari polychrome. Watson Windmill has a lot of actually Mimbres, black on white, and then um, uh, White Mountain Redware series, so it dates a little earlier. Um, but then most of these have Salado. And it, of course, Darnell stands out for having a lot of El Paso, and then these are earlier dating sites that stand out by themselves um, that are a bit odd. On its face, it might seem that these are clearly Salado because they have Salado predominant. Um, however, Salado sites don't usually have 20 to 30% Casas Grandes painted ceramics in their assemblage, and nor does vice versa. Salado ceramics are extremely rare on Casas Grande sites in the valley proper and other areas nearby. Um, this is somewhat within the normal range. It's a little high. Um, this is abnormal, though, for Casas Grandes related site, the El Paso polychrome. Um, and then it has a variety of, of other ceramic types um, that I'm not going to get into necessarily. Now, that's the painted wares. How about the, the, un, the 
the red slip wears, the relationship between Cloverdale Corgan and Blyas Red. Here's, like I said, where actually I think you actually can learn more about what's going on here because the painted wares get exchanged in and, and traded and perhaps everything kind of mixes and melds and doesn't really become as clear. Through the, through the red slip wares, which are predominantly locally produced in this area and exchanged or we'll know that soon enough. I'm pretty sure they're being certainly exchanged based on the temper and paste and there's some very clear differences between those found at Joyce Well versus those at Jay Cowan and, and so forth. Um, this is what it is. Sites in southeastern Arizona, except for this really early one, um, are overwhelmingly Cloverdale corrugated. Almost actually very little that I would call plyus. It, there's a lot of this red slip plane, especially at earlier sites. Um, some might suggest that this is Salado. It's not Salado. The, the red slip is not that red color that you would find on, on, the, on the slipped unpainted portion of a Salado polychrome, nor is the temper fitting, nor is the thickness of the vessel. And additionally, we don't actually have that many um, Salado polychrome sherds, because um, most of them are Gila polychrome, which means the design covers most of the vessel of a jar, to have a predominantly a large assemblage of, of just plain red slip that are clearly, they're just not from the rest of that vessel. Now, if you go over to the Casas related sites, so those in New Mexico, you almost have the exact opposite. You have a lot of Plyus red, very little Cloverdale, actually very low Cloverdale corrugated. Um, and this got me kind of thinking very interestingly because Cloverdale corrugated is thought to relate to, to Plyus Red. And I thought, well, what if it doesn't? And I was at the, um, the SAAs recently and uh, Matt Pales and numerous colleagues had images of ceramics that they found in the Fronteros Valley, a little bit to the south of my study area in Sonora. And they have this that they call pseudo corrugated and corrugated. And this looks extremely similar to what you get on Cloverdale corrugated, which has really no other historical connection readily available in the study area. Um, there's really not a corrugated type that predates it that looks similar. Some have suggested reserve, but it, it's not really reserve, it's different. I would hypothesize it relates to ancestral Otham um, ceramic technology and techniques. Um, potentially even represents the northward expansion of Opata groups, which we know historically lived just south of the border into southeastern Arizona at this time, further making this a really interesting dynamic where you have multiple identities coinciding or ethnic groups if you would prefer. Now here's another thing. I, I categorized each shirt of Cloverdale corrugated whether it was plain slipped or red slipped. I've also done this with the internal um, distribution on whether it's, it's smudged or polished or red slipped or anything, but I'm just looking at the exterior surfaces, the most readily visible part of, of particularly jars. Um, and here's what you get. Ceram now here's where Cloverdale corrugated is most common, I guess, compared to Plyus. And yet the majority of Cloverdale corrugated shirts are not red slipped, they're plain. This kind of counteracts the, the narrative that they're red slipped um, gouged wear. Um, that red slip part isn't really accurate anymore. They're mostly plain. And over here are those sites in far southwestern New Mexico. They're mostly red slipped. This is where I think there maybe might be an intentional relationship occurring between Plyus Red and Cloverdale Corrugated. Namely that despite there being far lower frequencies of Cloverdale Corrugated at these sites, the inhabitants of Joycewell in particular both particularly Culberson and Joyce as well, selectively opted to get more red slipped Cloverdale corrugated than plain. And remember this one's biased because this one is a, is a survey sample. We, we would really have to go back and systematically survey and document the ceramic assemblage on the surface. So I'm gonna do a brief summary and then we're gonna try and put this in a bigger picture for one. First, um, the Animus Fae sites proper those with Casas Grandes and Salado polychromes and stronger ties perhaps to the Casas Grande system clearly post date AD 1300. Yet there's some contain earlier components and it's probable that under un investigate sites and portions um, similarly do so. I think if we went back and re-excavated part of Pendleton, um, we would definitely find that. And especially if we went and excavated Maddox with a two Ds and an X and enjoy as well, we'd find earlier components. Architecturally, none of these sites really, I didn't, I didn't get into all of my architectural analysis, that'll be actually coming out in an article forthcoming, um, do not really fit in either Salado or Casas Grande suites, but fall really somewhat in between with some potential exceptions. Um, they all have histories of termination of room block expansion prevalent, especially the larger sites. These aren't sites that were fully occupied all at once for the most part. T doors, though, remain mostly unknown or fully restricted to specific boot heel sites. They're not readily ubiquitous. They're at the sites with most common to Casas Grandes. 
Um, however, collared postals and platform horse do not. Those are found at sites throughout southeastern Arizona. If you define platform horse as anything raised, the scalloped hearths, like the ones I showed you, are only really found at Joycewell, Timberlake, and Culberson, as far as we know. Ceramically, similarly so. Um, COVID corrugated does not relate really to plast thread, but maybe ancestral popta pottery. Um, there may be a preference towards red slipped. There are numerous other ceramic types test to important relationships and probable population movement, including um, Santa Cruz poly, Babu Kumari polychrome, um, and El Paso brownware, um, mostly El Paso polychrome, but also actually El Paso bichrome in some cases. There are no clear distinction between connectedness to Casas Grandes and presence or absence of effigy vessels. Effigy vessels occur at sites that others might classify as salado, and salado vessels do occur at some sites people will call Casas Grandes. Um, that's not a clear um, break in between the two. And this, this actually fits well with, with other models. Um, you find Casas Grandes effigy vessels actually um, occasionally at sites and on White Sands Missile Range in the Wernada Mogion, um, with very few connection between the two. That's obvious in some cases. Um, overall, though, the, the history there radically shifted really during the terminal 13th century. I do mean terminal. I would say the burn dates at Clanton Draw and Joyce Well, 1270, 1280, really showcase that there was a, a shift at that time. Architecturally, there's a shift. Ceramically, there's a shift. There are shifts in the mortuary record. I'm not going to discuss them. Um, towards one containing two competing potentially markers of identity, not readily found elsewhere in either Salado or near Pocky, Maine. And I think that reflects that this is a really dynamic location that's occurring. And finally, evidence does support some population migration, um, as well as moderate existing populations. Um, for instance, we have, um, there is evidence from um, uh, isotopic analysis of human remains at Pakime that some individuals came from sites potentially in the boot heel. We haven't sampled enough there to tell. Most likely Joyce Well, I would suggest. And I would suggest probably that some people from Casas Grandes or nearby, probably more nearby than Pakime itself, migrated to and helped um, expand an already established Joyce Well, Timberlake, and Clanton draw sites, uh, not Clanton draw, Culberson ruin sites. Um, and maybe somewhat vice versa with the Salado affiliated sites in southeastern Arizona. Um, however, I think the majority of the population there is in situ San Simon Sulphur Springs populations just redistributing. Um, I'm going to briefly acknowledge, and if I have a little bit of time, I'm going to put this in a bigger picture. Um, my five research uh, institutional partners, the Amaranth, the Museum of Indian Arts and Cultures, Cochise College, who have been tremendous. That's where the majority of the sample actually came from. Central Nino Sonora, um, the Peabody Museum of Archaeology. I have my committee here and numerous individuals who've offered support, data, interpretations, um, uh, documents and others, and then my financial supporters. It's supported by, by MER, by ASM, by ARC and HIS. Um, by the Paleos Foundation, the National Science Foundation, and many others. And I lastly want to thank my wife, um, Heather, who um, has allowed me to, uh, during COVID, bring in, um, with the approval, of thousands of shirts home for me to analyze and really uh, put a lot of dust on my floor um, and then clean that up. So I really want to appreciate that. Um, I'm going to quickly put it in a bigger perspective so hopefully you guys can all understand maybe um, why it's so important, this new idea. So here's the bigger picture. This is how we often think of southeastern Arizona. It's either Mogion or it's Hocom or Ancestral Autumn, depending on who you ask. Um, I would tend to lean with the Mogion people, but I wouldn't deny that there are Ancestral Autumn connections throughout. And this really has its origins in the, the eighth century with a variety of little isolated circumscribed in those valleys, intermontane valleys in between the sky islands that actually have major impacts on these cultures. Um, these red and brown traditions that oftentimes people look at and say are ancestral autumn, but are produced entirely in a way consistent and have designs still consistent with, um, uh, with um, uh, Mugion type pottery, especially red and brown in many ways, or those south, yet they use um, ancestral autumn figurines, as you can see here. It's kind of intermixing this interstitial area between the two. So it's, it's an in-situ population um, create, developing its own culture in clear connection with two others, but it's not really well tied in. Starting in the 900s, it becomes readily integrated into um, probably, I would say, more so the ancestral autumn regional system, the Hohokam ball court network, if you prefer. Um, some of these I would dispute based on the descriptions that are present. These are readily apparent. So are these. Um, these are a little less certainty. Um, but in any case, the expansion of the ball court network along the San Pedro and the Safford area had tremendous impacts for local populations, began tying them more closely into ancestral autumn ways of of constructing um, structures, uh, interring deceased, 
and, and actually producing pottery. And you see this especially in the Safford area where we have multiple ball courts, as you can see here and here. This is um, excavated by Tui in 1959, and this is recorded by Bandelier and Fuchs later on, um, and, and replica like pottery that's produced locally in the Safford area. And underrepresented simultaneously is members expansionism into particularly south, far southwestern New Mexico, um, where we have numerous pit houses, potentially. Um, we just have sherds and small depressions on, recorded on survey throughout the boot heel in the San Bernardino Valley, attesting to potentially the um, integration of the area with, with members groups. We also have, um, this is something you're going to hear a lot more about, and this is all I'm going to say about this, because Pat and I I are, are working on stuff. Um, there's a really important site right here. It's called the West Baker site. Um, it's very obviously um, a member site. It's in the, it's not in the Boot Hill proper, but it's in Hidalgo County. It's in far southwestern New Mexico, far outside um, the members valley. And it's the most membersy looking thing for a while. There's some other larger sites out here, Cabin Wells in particular, but it, it is unique in itself, um, suggesting that there is very definitively members expansionism out towards the area and, and potentially even further. In the late 1200s and 1300s with the um, early 1300s with the um, really appearance of two, I would say competing religious systems um, in for the Southern Southwest in that area, um, Paquime, Casas Grandes and Salado, um, you see the area transition again where it shifts to an area where populations existed in this interstitial space, engaging with multiple different cultures, uh, multiple different migrants, including northward reaching Opatha. And so for that way, I call it a borderlands um, because I want to emphasize that multi-directional relationships that are happening. There's no way to understand the record that's going on by just saying this site's a Casa site, this site's a Salado site, because that's not what the architecture, more true record and ceramics tell you, let alone the projectile points and other um, material culture or the, um, the indigenous uh, oral histories themselves. And by looking at this way as a borderlands, it also, also offers us one more historically contingent way to think about this. We have occupations potentially as late as 1380, 1390, and the establishment of this borderlands really has its origin in that termination of sites in the late 1200s, the expansion, probably I would say a little bit of competition, not necessarily violent, but at least competition of form of two religious systems in this area. And then it terminates 1380, 1390, based on radiocarbon dates. And this offers a very different borderlands to appear, one that occurs historically. And that is the expansion of um, Athabascan groups that we know arrive into the northern southwest by, by the 1300s or so, um, Taos and other areas. The expansion of these Athabascan groups into a partially vacated, depopulated area of the southwest. Sim something similar happened with the Dene over here. Um, and we have evidence for Athabascan occupation at numerous sites, particularly in the mountain areas. Um, it's very easy to say that these all date to the 17, 1800s. However, until we radiocarbon date them, we just don't know. Um, so with that, I'm going to close it and I'm going to move to questions. Thank you so much, Thatcher. You have analyzed a lot of pottery in this. So um, thanks for all of that. Um, I do just see one comment right now, but go ahead, uh, those of you out there, put your questions in the Q&A box um, so, so that you can explain some of the things that you're thinking about. Um, and so there's a comment that on the first Salado polychrome slide, Salado poly polychrome is Roosevelt redware, not White Mountain redware. Do you have anything to say to that or do you agree with that? Oh, yeah. I. I did I, say, I didn't say it was white mountain redware. It is, yeah, Salado is Roosevelt redware. Um, we just call it here in New Mexico, oftentimes just Salado polychrome. It has a very different history. It relates to Maverick Mountain and Tucson. They're two divergent tracks, but they're related. Mm, okay. Um, other questions out there? Go ahead, put them in the Q&A. We'll wait a couple of minutes. Sometimes it takes a bit for folks to get their questions in there. There we go. Coming through, um, what sort of entities, forces, and places was Salado religion focused on? Oh, that is an interesting question. Um, that depends on what Salado you're talking about. Um, Salado is kind of still used as a catch-all term for a variety of different, um, for just a shared polychrome type, 
but it's actually, it's locally, it's very divergent throughout the Southwest. If you look at um, Vapaki or platform mountain communities in the ancestral Altam area, um, they're very, di very different histories of what they're related to. They have Salato polychrome, Tonto base and others versus um, here. If I had to give a short answer, I don't actually necessarily know as much. Um, we don't know a lot about these areas of far southeastern Arizona Salado rituality in a sense. We don't have Kiva structures in this far southeastern area. We sometimes have potential pit roomy looking things, but they're different. Okay. Um, what about all the Gila polychrome at Casas Grandes? Yes, there's a lot of Gila polychrome at Casas Grandes, um, and, but it's but it's it's pretty much restricted to two rooms, pretty much in the warehouse, as we call it, in room eighteen eight, if I recall, and adjacent rooms where they store them, um, and they're stacked. They're they're Gila polychrome, or probably actually cliff polychrome. No one's gone back and reanalyzed them, but probably cliff um, polychrome bolts that look very similar. We don't know where they were produced. It is fundamentally possible that they were produced at some of the sites I talked about or further to the north. Um, that's something um, I'm hoping my NAA data set will contribute to the future. If anyone ever um, uh, conducts sourcing on any of those shirts from Pakime, they can actually tie it to a particular site I looked at. Um, but if you look outside of Pakime, you very rarely find uh, Salado polychrome at those sites. It's very infrequent. Um, suggesting that this is a very Pakime focused um, curated power in a sense. Okay. Um, let's see. Could you elaborate on the competing religious ideas of Salado versus Casas Grandes? Can you elaborate on that a little more? Okay. Um, so we oftentimes don't necessarily refer to them as that way, that that's, I think, because we often don't call Casas Grandes a, a religion or necessarily having um, a religious component to it. We, we would call it shamanism and other things like that, but we don't usually take these iconographically charged depictions of macaws and, and plume serpents um, and correlate those with those we find on Salado, where you similarly find icons that are either horned serpents or um, or macaws, depending on which way you want to look at the image. And so they basically are two different ways of using mostly water or sun related symbolism, depending on how you want to think of them. Um, and so I, I view them as necessarily competing because you typically have predominantly one or the other. Okay. Um, there was a follow up to the Gila polychrome shirts. Um, in every context that DePeso reported, that's the question. Um, so do you want to that's speak that's to that? May. Yeah, that's Pakime. Pakime is a very different site. It, I mean, it, you obviously can't talk about Pakime without necessarily discussing Salado at it. Um, it is pretty much found, but the majority of the sites are present, majority of, of Salado are present within very particular contexts within there. Um, we have a bit of a biased assemblage at Pakime. And I think if we went back and reanalyzed, which is not going to happen, um, we get a very different picture of what we have there. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, uh, Tom Wright says, excellent presentation. Can you relate any of the differences you observe to environmental and subsistence factors, sort of elevation, soil, proximity to water, et cetera? Any differences from valley to valley? Mm -hmm. um, sites tend to be, particularly the larger sites, of course, tend to always be around. Um, um, small ephemeral streams. They're actually, there's no large riverways except for the San Pedro. And interestingly enough, these sites are larger than any found along the middle or upper San Pedro, except for maybe Via Verde um, in Sonora at the headwaters. Um, and yet these, these waterways are much smaller. I would say the main thing that's actually impacting the changes that are occurring is that thing I first highlighted, which is um, it, that clearly also impacted earlier, if you look at the 8th through the 9th, 10th centuries, um, which is these north-south running mountain chains really restrict travel between these resulting in um, somewhat isolated cultural units that are very similar to one another, but slightly distinctive. And you see these in the pottery, San Simon to Dragoon um, to Baba Kamari. They're literally a hop and a skip away from one another. They're a little different, and then they hop very differently as you move further west. Uh, by restricted, I don't mean um, fundamentally inhibited, but rather made it more difficult. You had to cross through certain passes necessarily. 
Um, there's also not readily, um, there is clay that is good enough to fire pots, but you can see differences in the quality of the clay and the temper that can be used, um, impacting the, what people can and can't produce possibly. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, can you elaborate on the conflict and possible Apachean, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, connection? You touched on the end of the talk. Is there a possibility of arriving a patient spurring the conflict? Okay. Um, the Apache idea, the Athabascan or, or proto, I would use the term proto Apache because I don't think they had established themselves um, in their full cultural unit as we would understand it, um, archaeologists. Um, really comes from, there is some evidence from the work of Denny Seymour and others that there are potentially semi-mobile, very mobile nomadic groups existing in the International Four Corners area um, in the late 1300s, very ephemeral, very difficult to identify, um, possibly the 1400s. This is something that really needs um, future investigation and systematic investigation. Um, uh, uh, Athabascan archaeology, particularly Apache archaeology, early Apache is some of the most difficult archaeology, particularly for those who focus on um, Pueblo style structures. They, they tend to miss those more ephemeral signs. Uh, the slide of the Mills collection at EAC and Thatcher, was that collection from one site? Where and where and was there a report for the excavation? That is from multiple sites, actually. And um, I would direct that individual to pull up um, Anna Nitzel and Patrick Lyons' 2005 technical report reporting on their an partial analysis of the Mills' collection. It details the sites excavated and where some of these vessels come from. Um, there are reports for nearly all of the Mills' sites. Um, but some of those vessels came from Kaikendal and some of them came from um, what what is the the Pueblo Viejo site, the, the one in Safford that they called, um, they called it Salmonville. Oh, it was called Salmonville. They were called Curtis. Okay. All right. Um, could you comment further on the proposed Odom ancestry of the International Four Corners? Okay. Yeah. Um, this is, I, I tend to think that it's a very interesting sort of topic because especially in New, New Mexico archaeology, we oftentimes think of it as Mogollon. If you look earlier, it looks very Mogollon. Um, however, the fact that we have clearly, um, I, I would I would almost hesitate to call them ancestral subibriodon population migrants at say the Reagan site, um, Opata populations moving potentially northward. Um, there are clear ties to areas from ancestral Odom um, into contemporary Odom communities, both in their oral histories that they publish readily or talked about readily, especially for the San Pedro. Um, I think it's a topic that needs more future investigation. I don't necessarily see it as readily apparent as I would, I would hesitate to call it Pueblo with a lowercase p because I don't know which one I would associate, probably Zuni most commonly, but many different groups. Um, it's just not as readily apparent. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so a little bit about, um, so how far south do you see the Mimbris and are the Mimbris associated with Pakime? Okay, oh. um, Mimbris, Mimbris go pretty far south. I mean, if you're talking Mimbris shirts, they certainly go to South Central Chihuahua in very low frequencies, like we're talking one every couple sites. There is a cluster of Mimbris shirts at um, in and around Pakime, and there's um, quite a bit up in the Hanos area overall, if you compare it, we're, compared to local pottery, they're swamped. Um, this is something I, I've written on and published where I think that um, th there's, a, there's a standing debate between those who view members as having moved south and established Pakime or substantially impacted Pakime's development and those who say that it's entirely local and there maybe was some low level engagement. I've published kind of, I guess you could call it a midpoint where I suggest um, there is some, in my mind, at least robust evidence for um, a refugee, I guess, population is how we would see it anthropologically, population of members who have established themselves into a much larger existing um, population of Pakime. I see the two populations genetically, they're fairly closely related. Um, I see them as having had long-term interconnection, intermarriage and relationships. So I don't see them necessarily as coming in and radically um, changing one's culture, but rather being kind of like, um, I guess you'd call them cousins in a sense. And where did the population come from at Casas Grandes to design those T-shaped doors? Um, and, and this person says Lexan's Meridian at Chaco? Mm -hmm. Question, question. Um, 
I do not ac agree with the southern portion of the meridian. Uh, many people do not. Um, however, I have not yet heard a satisfactory answer to the um, establishment and expansion of tea doors out of, out of Pakime. They're not only found at Casas Grandes Pakime, they're also found at other sites in the upper, at a few sites in the upper Gila and then the Sierra Ancha of, of central Arizona. Um, but I have not yet heard a, a, a really robust explanation necessarily for them. Okay. Um... Let's see. Only members in Casas have subfloor burials. Nobody else. Isn't that interesting? That's not entirely true. 50% of, of, of mortuary features in the um, Sierra Blanca area and in the Roswell area, and you can read this in Jamie Clark's um, and uh, John Spess's newest book and in, and in previous books by them, are subfloor burials. It actually increases over time in that portion and in the El Paso phase area. Um, there are in the Safford area, we also find subfloor burials actually appear and increase. I think it actually relates, and you see this a worldwide phenomenon. This occurs in, in southwestern um, Asia. Um, it seems to relate to land tenure ship, actually, that you're anchoring yourself in the land. That's not to say necessarily that that particular practice um, that is shared between Membres and Casas Grandes doesn't necessarily have an ancestry, but it's not unique to those two places in the southwest northwest. Okay. Um, so there is follow up. Um, this area is pretty much outside the known mm -hmm. historical range of the autumn, right? Yes, like, yeah. yes, it is. Yeah, it's it's just um, if you um, read the 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 newest um, that'll be my my brief little plug. Actually, I have it over here. <laughs> Vapaki, if it pops up, it's a wonderful book. Um, they make the case that it's within um, an ancestral old um, space. Um, I, as I said, don't necessarily see it, but I'm not going to, as an archaeologist, necessarily discount uh, indigenous heritage to an area that, um, that they may have other ties that I just don't see. Okay. And um, can you repeat that 2005 reference for the Mills Collection Analysis? Certainly. It's by Anna Nutzel and by, um, by Patrick Lyons. It's it's a technical report by the Center for Desert Archaeology. You can download it freely available online, which is now Archaeology Southwest. Um, it's it's got a title like an analysis of the the Mills collection. I'd have to pull it up. It's a hundred and some pages. Um, and then they didn't publish. Um, they published a few images in there. Um, if you have any problems, feel welcome to contact me, and I can provide you with a copy of that. Okay, that sounds great. Um, so and and. All of you who are online now and those who missed it tonight, who signed up and missed it, will get um, uh, a follow-up email with the ARC and HIS email address in it. So if you do need more on that re reference, you're welcome to just put it into that address and then I'll forward that on to Thatcher so um, or, or get you that reference if you need it. All right, I think that's it. Um, seeing a few comments that say great job, Thatcher. And thank you, thank you, thank you so much for doing this this evening. Good luck oh, tomorrow. No, th th thank you, Fran, for inviting me. And, and I really want to thank um, Ark and Hiss, um, who funded me twice, actually, um, yeah. for this research. And I really appreciate it. They funded um, some of the radiocarbon dates you saw. Um, I'm really um, pleased with them, and I'm really happy that you guys were financially supported me through my grad school years. Yeah, that's so great. Yes, we're glad to do that. Um, I just see that Alan Dart, let me put this up. Alan Dart just put this reference, uh, so I'm putting that out to everyone. I'll give it a minute so you have a chance to copy it. Um, yeah, so um, any other comments? Anything you'd like to say as we close up, Thatcher? Um, yeah, I'll make a, a little plug um, for those of you who are aspiring archaeologists, are avocationalists, or maybe have graduate students or will have graduate students, Rob. Um, kick your students to go work with collections at, at poorly, um, poorly documented areas or institutions that have really no analysis that's been done on them. That's what happened at Cochise. They had six sites. They had a small summary. They were all excavated in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s. Um, this was the first systematic analysis of all of them. And you can learn a lot from doing that. You can always go back and revisit older collections, but that's something I really um, think is really valuable that people should keep their mind into. Go push areas that we don't know that much about and work with older collections. There's plenty of problems you will have with the archives. Do it. Great, thank you. Really appreciate it. You've got some comments coming up and I will forward those to you when this is over. 
So thank you so much. And thank you, everyone out there. Um, join us again in July, July 17th, for the next lecture with Michael Searcy. And thank you for being here tonight. And good night.